So uh, as, as Annetta mentioned, I'm one of the founding fellows uh, of this organization, this very special organization. Um, and I'm a decisive non-expert. I am not an expert of anything. Um, so I do look forward to doing subjects on which I know nothing. Uh, and it's an excuse to start to understand how anyone that has access to the entire internet becomes a conspiracy theorist no matter what. <laughs> So when I when I found out I was doing the Egyptian Hall, you know, I thought this is this is, I got it in the bag. Okay, this is the first night of Odd Salon. It's our fifth year. It's my twelfth talk. I've got this shit. Okay, it's a piece of cake, right? I'll, I'll just put up a couple of cool posters on the wall, and then all of us nerds will get really excited, and then I'll walk off and feel really good about myself, right? Well, but then I started doing the research, and I started making timelines over a century, and I realized that the Egyptian Hall was open for nearly a century, had at least four different venue managers at, that I could find, and showcased everything from one of the largest collections of New World artifacts, is my sound okay by the way? Okay. Um, uh, of New World art artifacts to what was essentially circus folk to demonstrations that disproved seances. All of this they had five different monarchs, five of them, while this thing was open, and I just knew I was just fucked. So um, I did what any good Criminal Minds fan would do, and I went to the post-it notes. And I found a way to narrow down those suspects, I mean, story. And you know what? Lucky for you, dear Odd Salon audiences, that I've kind of managed to create a structure around this shit, so let's just get going and see how we go, okay? Cool. So let's start at the very beginning. Turn of the century London, 19th, uh, turn of the 19th century, excuse me. You know, we all like to think it was like this, but really it was more like this. Um, it makes sense, because the world was an absolute shit show at that time. Great Britain was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, which ripped the entire agricultural social fabric apart, moving hundreds of thousands of people from the country to cities like London. And at the same time, the world was becoming smaller than it had ever been. Imagine only knowing what was in your backyard or at least in the city, the town over. Well, now trade routes were being discovered, wars were being fought, the Americans had told the Brits to fuck right off in 1776, and were expanding further into the... <laughs> good job, guys, that was good. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> um, uh, we're expanding further into the new American West as well. And by 1803, the Napoleonic Wars had pushed the post-revolution France further afield than it had ever been, including to Egypt, which no one in the Western world had really known anything about before that. Uh, this is actually uh, the Battle of the Pyramids in 1798, which was painted in 1810. I know it's confusing. It took me some time, too, by Baron Antoine Jean Gross. And remember, at this time in England, this guy was still, oh, oh yeah, that asshole. Um, <laughs> uh, remember that during this time, this guy was still king. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, not that one, that one. <laughs> yeah, this asshole, okay. Um, this George, the same George from Hamilton, was still king of England at this time. <laughs> um, so while America was hashtag winning and Napoleon was out there conquering the earth, Britain was dealing with the fact that its social society was starting to sort of devolve, all well at the same time. Information that, frankly, would have been pretty scary if you'd never seen it, started to stream into the country. So now we're going to zoom in. This is, in 1805, William Bullock, this guy, a goldsmith and hoarder, really, was getting into gathering the trinkets, artifacts, and plunder, frankly plunder, that was pouring into London at the time. Um, his collection began gathering attention, so he set up a little shop in Piccadilly, and suddenly it saw over 22,000 visitors at his little museum, which included Jane Austen, who said, quote, she found some amusement, though my preference for men and women always inclined me to attend more to the company than the sight. Sick burn on the nerds there, Jane. Sick burn. <laughs> but Bullock needed a bigger boat. I mean, hall. So this is the Egyptian Hall. It was originally named the London Museum, and it was built in 1812 for 16,000 pounds. It was the first building in England to be built in the Egyptian style. So if you think about it, with these, uh, the French campaigns, they were starting to send back all of these folios uh, with more information about, um, about Egypt and all the things being found. So this building was described as Egyptian eclectic, whatever the fuck that means. And of course, this exterior kind of pissed off the locals. They called it strident exoticism. I think nowadays we call it cultural appropriation, but anywho, that's... <laughs> A whole other talk. Um, 
So he, he put together this hastily assembled hall uh, that was designed for the recep uh, re reception, exhibition, and sale of valuable curiosities. Things like high-minded art. We're going to make the art yell something. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. I like that, too. That's good. Um, and he also uh, liked to exhibit science. By the way, this was actually, he actually put out a yearly compendium of everything that he'd collected. And this was from the front of his fish page. All the fishes had different poems, and all the animals have poems. But how did they pay for this art and science? Of which the, thank you. <laughs> this is going to go long. Um, Jesus. Uh, but how did they pay for that? Well, they paid for it by attracting people who wanted to see what was essentially grave robbery, stealing from native peoples, and presenting other cultures like zoo animals. For instance, they got colonialism. You stole my line, man. Um, they got his, uh, uh, Napoleon's carriage from Waterloo. Over 220,000 people saw it. And this one exhibit of Mexican artifacts included actual people. Um, Bullock was obsessed with ethnographic specimens, so essentially he dressed up the hall as what he thought a temple of Mexico was going to look like and filled it with clothing and death's heads and mutilated hands and burning incense and deformed cows and big snakes and idols and maps and paintings on skins and a real Mexican that they brought over from Mexico and probably took from their house and it's really sad. But Bullock didn't count on the fact that the London snobs didn't find that very interesting. Uh, this is from a review of that show, I quote, Mr. Bullock has been to Mexico, and we regret to find, to very little purpose, for his collection of Mexican curiosities is excessively meager, and is little calculated to make us acquainted with Mexico, as a piece of ore would enable us to judge of the nature and extent of the mines. That was like a third of the review. Um, <laughs> I read it. <laughs> it was brutal. <laughs> so this brings us to act two, uh, what I like to call the freak show, and the reason I'm putting it in quotes uh, we'll go over later, era. Um, I don't have a picture of him, but George Lackington was a bookseller who actually chronicled over 200,000 books in his first uh, uh, compendium, and then 800,000 in the second. Uh, in 1825, he bought the museum and tried to make it the intellectual gathering place of Piccadilly. Uh, he brought in speakers from various disciplines, kind of like what we do here. Um, lectures from the New English Art Club, a Blue Cholera Symposium, and the Temperance Congress of 1862 all use this same place. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if we had the Temperance Union here? It would go over really well. Um, Albert Smith entertained audiences with his trips up Mont Blanc. But again, how did they pay for this? This asshole. So, Good old-fashioned exploitation of human difference paid for it. Uh, you all know Phineas T. Barnum. He's been mentioned on this stage quite a few times from his famous circus. But what you may not know is that he brought his first act to the Egyptian Hall. That's right, Charles Sherwood Stratton, who was just over three feet tall, performed as Tom Thumb. Um, and for 50 years, the Egyptian Hall paid for some of these intellectual pursuits by exhibiting things like the Siamese twins, which were conjoined twins from the East, which was then called Siam, which is why they were called Siamese twins. And yes, that's where the term came from. And a living skeleton, who was essentially a man who has a normal height, but only weighed 77 pounds. Indeed, a pamphlet of the time, and this is where the quotes come in, set the fashion in freaks. They were really pathetic. So it's kind of like the BuzzFeed of the Victorian age, right? Like, you got your clicks to pay for your news. I'm not in the news business. I don't know if that's accurate. So we're just going to go to Act 3 very quickly. Um, this was 50 years later, 1873, the magic era. William Morton, a performance manager and someone who ended up making theater rather respect uh, respectable in the Victorian into the Edwardian ages, took on the lease and renovated the hall. Uh, this was the time when the British Empire was expanding. Uh, the uh, technology and exploration were going at the speed of light, which was wonderful for many things, but also really frightening for quite a few people. Uh, and this has been talked about here a lot, but this is the rise of the Victorian spiritualism movement. And all the charlatans and the people that were profiting off of the heartache of those that wanted to talk to their loved ones. Um, yeah, those assholes. So which is why we're ending with this man. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know if Miles Traer is here, one of our fellows. 
Uh, I'm talking about something related to magic without his permission, so I'm just going to let that go. Um, John Neville Maskelyne, a man of great performative re renown, especially in magic, he stayed in residence at the hall for 31 years with his partner, George Alfred Cook. And the reason he got into magic was because he wanted to disprove the charlatans. He wanted to prove that these seances were not real, that there was a logical, physical explanation for everything. And the way that he disproved these things, like the occult, was he performed them for audiences. He even wrote books on how to, you know, cheat at cards and some, that's a whole other talk as well, I guess. Um, and he did this for 31 years. So this wonderful hall that had everything from, uh, from anthropological issues and, and all the way up through magic, uh, it lasted until 1905 when it was then demolished. Um, those assholes demolished it and guess what? Condos went in, essentially. It was, it was definitely gentrification. Um, so I think this is appropriate, all of us here. I would like everyone to raise a glass to gathering and to learning something weird. Thank you.